Denver Golf Expo. Thank you for coming to the 11 o'clock swing seminar with us it is PGA professional Rick Tim. Rick is an uh, instructor at the Family Sports Center and Centennial. He's going to be talking with us today about how to control your wedges. Uh, so without any further ado, we're going to hand it over to Rick and we'll get started. Test, test, test. How's everybody doing? Good. Get some good deals at the expo. And awesome, awesome. Well, welcome to the seminar. Uh, my name is Rick Tim, like Patrick mentioned. Uh, I've been teaching the game for about 30 years, so uh, I've seen a few golf swings. Uh, I guarantee you can't show me anything I haven't already seen. Um, but today we're going to talk about wedge control. Um, this is a pretty difficult part of the game because it uh, has a lot to do with uh, touch and feel. Uh, I always say I'd much rather hit a full swing driver than a little 57 yard sandwich. That's a much more difficult shot than swinging a driver. A driver, you got a perfect lie, it's up on a tee. You can't have a better scenario, but that little 57 yard sandwich over that bunker with a pin cut tight, that's, that's a pretty tough shot. So uh, I've uh, got a little handout there for you, kind of a little uh, itinerary or uh, summary of what we're going to look at. Um, and you can take this with you, of course, and uh, feel free to uh, you know, contact me through my website, timgolf.com, or uh, through my email. And uh, if you have any questions, uh, I'll do a little question and answer session right after the seminar. So the first thing we're going to talk about is um, setup. And um, I'd like to discuss actually the difference between chipping and pitching. A lot of people really have a, a hard time distinguishing the two shots. I want you to know that by definition, the pitching shot is where the ball travels the majority of the distance in the air. A lot of people confuse that with chipping. Chipping is where the ball travels the majority of the distance on the ground. Okay? We're going to discuss pitching today and wedge control. And um, so the first thing we're going to talk about is how we set up to the golf ball. Now, what I like to do is I like to always start out, and I'm not sure if you can see this very well, but the um, ball should be in the center of your stance. Okay? Then I like to have my both feet move out equal space, preferably just underneath my shoulders. Um, next step I like to do is basically just turn my body a little bit towards the target. This is called opening your body to the target. And I have a distinct reason why I like to do that. Um, some people just tell you to open your body and, and leave it at that, but I like to give you a, kind of a, a reason why you should do that. Um, with a uh, limited uh, distance shot, um, you don't have to have a full body rotation like you would for a maximum distance shot. So I want to actually preset my body to not have to move it as much. So I'm basically allowing my body to face the target so that I don't have to move it. Okay? If I was square to the golf ball, I would have to move my body out of the way to get my golf club to go to the target. So, and this is pretty common. You'll see everybody that, that does any abbreviated distance shots, they open their body to the target. Okay? So that's the first thing I like to do. Now, as far as ball position is concerned, you can, you can play around with this to get different trajectories. Um, I like to keep it maybe just slightly left of my belt buckle for any kind of a pitching shot. You know, if I was talking to a single digit handicap, you know, we could play a little bit more around with that ball position. But I'm going to give you just a, a basic setup position. And then uh, depending on your handicap range, that's where you might want to be a little bit more creative, a little bit more uh, variety in your ball position. Okay? So um, we're going to start from the ground up. So I've got my uh, body or my feet open to the target. Okay? Got the ball position just slightly left of the center of my body. Okay? So we're going to go move up to my, the handle of the golf club. We're going to place the handle just slightly left of the golf ball. Okay? So when I take my grip, you'll kind of notice that there's a nice distinctive straight line from the club all the way up to my left arm. Okay? And so you want to definitely have a feeling like from my shoulder down to my club head is a straight line. Okay. And again, this is just to uh, kind of create some consistency in your setup. I mean, every single golfer that I've ever taught in 30 years, there's one thing in common that they all want. 
and that's to be more consistent. Not everybody wants to hit it fun, but everybody wants to be more consistent. Even Tiger Woods. I think he shot 75 today. So he would probably prefer to shoot what he shot yesterday. So uh, everybody wants to be more consistent. So I'm giving you this uh, routine right here so that we can uh, try to maintain our consistency with every pitch shot we hit. Okay, so hands slightly ahead of the golf ball, okay? Now the next thing um, I like to talk about is, is our weight distribution. I feel like this is the most commonly overlooked thing um, for not allowing you to be consistent in your pitching motion, okay? And that's to maintain your weight on your front leg. So I'm right-handed, so it's my left leg. So I like to keep about 60% of my weight on my left leg, okay? All right, so this is the setup, okay? And uh, now we're gonna talk a little bit about motion. Um, this is, I'm just gonna give you a method. There's so many methods out there, it's, it's unbelievable. Phil Mickelson just came out with his DVD and his book, I mean, you know, there's just a lot of, lot of information out there. My thought is that you gotta pick a method that fits your handicap range. Like I'm not gonna teach a, a single handicap player the same as I would teach a beginner for this particular shot, okay? So um, motion-wise, when we get into um, dis dis discovering the different distances, um, you may want to look into uh, a three-wedge system, okay? How many people uh, out in the audience carry three wedges? Good, good. Well, I carry four, so you know, technically a pitching wedge is still a wedge, but um, the three wedges that I use for mostly for my short game are a 60 degree, a 56 degree, and a 52 degree, okay? And so, um, when you do go practice this, I'm gonna give you uh, the clock method to uh, discover different distances, and it's a little bit harder to practice at a range because it's not like you can go out there and walk off you know, 20 yards and put a bucket out there. So, um, at the Family Golf Center where I teach at, we have a 120 yard short game area, you can bring your own golf balls or buy your golf balls there, and you can utilize the uh, short game area, no charge, gear up, gather up the golf balls, and then go hit them out on the range, so you get to hit your ball more than once. I'm all about saving money, so. Um, but uh, wonderful short game area. If you haven't been out there, I highly recommend you come out and visit us. And uh, you can put, you know, head covers out there and, uh, and walk off your yardage, because when you have that 20 yard shot over that bunker or that 40 yard shot, um, you kind of have, have an idea of, of how to do it and how much speed you need to use to get that particular yard. Okay? So, um, all right, back to the swing. Uh, we're going to talk about the clock method. So, um, basically, everybody knows what a clock looks like. Six o'clock is down here, 12 o'clock is up here. Okay? And so, what we're going to do is we're going to work a, a swing about nine o'clock to three o'clock. Okay? Nine o'clock to three o'clock. And um, that's gonna produce a certain yardage with a 60 degree, a 56 degree, and a 52 degree. Because each one of those clubs produce a different trajectory, okay? Now, which one do you think is gonna roll farther? A 60 degree or a 52 degree? What do you think? 52 degree, that's correct. The lower trajectory. So if I have a particular shot where I have to hit it over a bunker, and not have a lot of room to roll the ball, I'm gonna choose this, good job. I'm gonna choose the 60 degree, because that automatically is gonna produce a little bit more spin and a little bit higher trajectory, therefore the ball is gonna land a little softer and not roll out, okay? So these, again, if you have a three wedge system, three sand wedge system, then you wanna practice that nine o'clock to three o'clock with all three of those clubs and, and see what your distance is, okay? Now, I'm gonna go ahead and make a, a couple of little motions here so you can see it in actual. I can't hit this golf ball, but. <clears throat> All right, so here I have a 60 degree. And uh, got my setup. Maintain that weight on your left foot, about 60%. And here's again, one of the most critical errors I see in amateurs is that most amateurs transfer their weight. You're dead in the water because you gotta transfer it back to make sure that you make ball contact first. It's difficult, difficult. You have to do it a lot. And let's face it, when you're on the golf course, how many shots do you get? 
on the range, you can hit 100 in a row. No problem, I got it. But on the golf course, you got one shot at each position. So you want to create as little movement as possible to, again, have the hope to have your consistency. Okay? So maintain that weight, 60% on that front leg. I'm going to move this out a little bit. Weight left, ball slightly left to center, grip in front of the golf ball. Okay. Nine o'clock, three o'clock. Notice that my weight is only moving on the forward motion. Okay. Um, you want to really feel like you're pivoting around this left leg. And again, this is just a method, but I found this to be very successful because what it does is it assures you of hitting the ball first. Okay? How many people have scolded here? Isn't that it's the most horrible feeling of scold? And so what happens is you're out on a golf course, you're playing around a golf, you scold one. Okay? So then you're going like, well, I don't want to scold this next one. I feel terrible about that one. So then what do you do? You hit it fat. You hit about two feet. Okay? So then you're guessing what's going to happen. Okay? And then deacceleration happens and a whole bunch of, you're just opening up a can of worms. So if you can work on maintaining this weight distribution here, there's not much that's going to happen with where the club meets the ground or the golf ball. You're going to find yourself to be more consistent by doing that. Okay? So we've got a 9 o'clock, this 3 o'clock position. Okay? Again, that's going to create a certain yardage with a 60, 56, and 52. Okay, um, and then again, like I said, you want to you want to practice this, and, and, and your yardage is going to be different than mine. Yours is going to be different than his. So it's an individual thing. Okay. Now, speed controls distance. There's nobody that's going to argue that in a million years. Speed controls distance. So you're going to have to develop touch. This is a very uh, much of a touch aspect of the game of golf. Okay. But it can really, you know, if you have some confidence in controlling your wedge distances. You're gonna you're gonna do really well scoring one. Okay? How many times have you hit a great drive, an iron shot right up close to the green, and then dumped it in the bunker? That's no fun at all. Okay. So the next thing you want to do is basically take that club and let's increase it to 10 o'clock. So here's your nine to three. Let's increase it to 10 o'clock and follow through to two o'clock. Okay. Yeah, everybody's got a pretty good idea of where that is. That, that's nine, that's 10, okay? You know, it doesn't have to be uh, exactly precise, but know that it's a little bit farther than nine. You know, you gotta play around with it, okay? But that 10 o'clock to two is gonna allow more room for you to get more speed. More speed, more distance. And this is the way you wanna think of this, okay? Um, so I'll go ahead and demonstrate a little 10 o'clock to two. And again, what I want you to focus on when I do this is um, just how much my body is shifting to the back, how much my weight is shifting. Hopefully none, okay? But you'll definitely see a little bit more speed with this motion. So 10 o'clock, two o'clock. A little bit more than three o'clock, okay? That's gonna give you a different distance. Watch it again. Weight left. 10 o'clock, okay? So that's gonna give you a different distance. 60, 56, 52. Different trajectories uh, allow for different rolls, okay? So you can have the same speed and that 52 degree is gonna roll more so than the 60 degree, okay? Like I said, if you have a field or if you have a, a, a driving range facility um, that has some uh, open area where you throw some head covers out there and just walk it off. One, two, walk off your yardages. I like to do 20, 40, 60. 20, 40, 60. And uh, you know, when I get over 60, um, there's a little bit more motion involved because there has to be more speed. But um, you know, I think if you, if you experiment with those yardages, then you can just make your adjustments. Because I hit, I hit sandwich, full sandwich, about 100, 110 yards, 105 yards right in there. 
60 degree. So that's going to be a different full swing yardage for each of you as well. But again, this is the clock method, okay? And, uh, and this is a, a pretty universal method used uh, among most players, okay? So 10 o'clock, 2 o'clock. It's going to give you certain yardage, okay? Notice the weight distribution. Notice there's no weight transfer. There's a pivot, okay? There's a lot of forward motion. You can't, you can't just be stiff. You gotta have some fluid, fluidness in your motion, okay? Um, and then the next step is to basically take it a little farther, okay? I mean, I love hitting wedges. I, I probably hit more wedges and, and putts uh, than, than anything else at all. I don't hit a lot of drivers. I'll go to the range and I'll hit maybe 15 drivers. That's good. So how many are you going to hit in a round of golf? Maybe, you know, at the extreme, 18 times you'll hit a driver. And that's if you got, you know, 200 and some yard par threes into the wind. But you're probably only going to hit your driver uh, around 14, 15 times, maybe, in a round of golf. So, but you're going to probably hit a lot of wedges in a round of golf. Definitely a lot of putts. All right, so next step would be to take the backswing up to about 11 o'clock. Remember, here's 12, so about 11 o'clock, and then follow through to about 1 o'clock. Okay? I'll go ahead and demonstrate that. One o'clock. Okay. Three wedges is going to give you three trajectories. It's going to give you three different distances. Okay. Remember the roll-off factor. I get a lot of questions from my students. Um, how do you put spin on the ball? Okay. That's like a whole other another seminar. But what's funny is I got people that can't break a hundred asking me about spin, and I tell them I said, well, let's just get you on the green. We'll, we'll, we'll worry about spin a little later. Okay. Let's just get you on the green, out of the bunker, stop you from belaying it. And uh, so again, it depends on your handicap range with uh, what information you're ready for, okay? I had a student uh, come to me, uh, and uh, he's about a 95 shooter, and uh, he had an instructor that was teaching him this. He said, well, my instructor said that uh, if I set up like this, I'm going to use more bounce. And I'm like, well, can you tell me what bounce is? He had no idea what bounce was. <laughs> and he's like, shoot 95. Now, yeah, you know, I mean, I mean, I've talked to maybe a, you know, a, a single-digit handicapper about, you know, kind of this Phil Mickelson stuff or whatever. But I'm not going to talk to somebody that's a, a mid-90 shooter about, uh, you know, this type of technique to get more bounce. You know, that's that's way ahead of where at the level that they're at. Okay. So um, again, this is a, a just a method for you to try. There's a ton of methods out there. And, uh, and I think that you'll, you'll start to experience uh, some more confidence in uh, acquiring different yardages and different distances with these different uh, the, uh, wedges in your back. Okay? Um, one of the last things I want to talk about is uh, tension. Now, how many people uh, uh, are nervous on the first team? Yeah, yeah, definitely. You're up there, maybe you're a single, you just join a threesome, you got people waiting behind you. That's the definition of tension right there, okay? Uh, the other definition of tension is uh, you got a lake in front of you, and you got a little 40-yard uh, shot over the lake to get it on the green, or a little pond. That's a pretty stressful situation, okay? So I'm going to give you uh, a technique, um, if you notice on that little uh, flyer I sent out to you. Um, uh, it's called brush stroke. Down in the swing, swing concept there, uh, it's called brush stroke, and I feel like if, uh, if you were a... Um, put this uh, into your routine, not only practice-wise, but also into your routine before you hit each shot that requires some touch, um, I feel like you're going to have a, a much more successful attempt at it, okay? So the brush stroke is simply a movement of the club back and forth to where we're actually catching the ground on both sides of the swing, okay? And what we're doing here is we're, we're getting used to getting the club down to the ground. I think 
you know, of, of, of the common faults of, of hitting a, a mishit with a wedge, uh, most people blade it. Most people blade it. Um, again, you can hit it fat too, you can hit the ground first, but I, I feel like most people blade it, and then when they blade it, they, they don't want to swing that fast, and then they chunk it. Okay, so that's kind of the sequence, okay? So by doing this brush stroke, what it does is it gives you a chance to get the club down to the ground and feel what that feels like. Because when you brush the grass like that, well, that's what actually has to happen in order for you to hit a good, good pitch shot. That has to happen. you got to hit the ground. There's no two ways about it. Okay? So anytime, and you'll know the next time you watch a, a tour event, if, if they show somebody around the greens, you watch. If they show them early enough, you'll see them doing this brush stroke. Just take note of the next time you watch a tournament. You'll see them up there, and they'll be moving that club back and forth like that. And what they're trying to do is they're trying to get relaxed, because they get nervous as well, and they're also trying to figure out the speed at which they need to get the proper distance. Because remember, speed controls distance. No doubt about it. Okay? So what I do is in my normal routine is I'll step back and under the rules of golf, I step back at least a club, like, a over a club length. Because if I were to brush the grass inside of a club length and that ball kind of moves a little bit, that's a penalty. So I step back more than a club length and I'll do my brush strokes from the golf ball. And all I'm doing is just getting the tension out of my arms, I'm letting that club brush along the grass, making sure I catch the grass. If I'm missing the grass here, what chance have we got to get up to the ball? Zero. Probably going to blame. So I do my brush strokes back at least a, more than a distance, a club length away from the golf ball. Brush, brush. And really critical to make sure you catch the ground on both sides of the swing. Okay? And I step up to the golf ball, do my little pre shot routine, ball position slightly left of the center of my body. Okay? Handle of the club slightly left of the golf ball. 60% of my weight maintained on my front leg, the leg that's closest to the hole for your left hand. Okay? And then depending whether I want to go 9, 10, or 11, and what, what sand wedge I have in my hand, depending on what yardage I have, I've already made that selection before I step up here. Then I go ahead and execute. So I feel like, uh, you know, if you try this method, um, You'll start to experience, uh, obviously, some more confidence. Um, you'll start to learn um, that uh, a same length swing with different trajectories causes different distances. Okay, and um, hopefully, uh, we'll shoot some lower scores. Who's all in favor of shooting some lower scores here? Yeah, no doubt, and being more consistent. Absolutely, absolutely. So uh, again, I'm at uh, Family Sports Center. Uh, that's off of uh, Arapahoe Road and Peoria over in Centennial by the airport. And, uh, I've got uh, some brochures up here that if you'd like to take a look at some of my instructional programs, feel free to uh, grab one. And uh, I'm gonna uh, open up to some questions if you wanna um, come up or if you wanna yell up. I don't have a microphone out there, so you'll probably have to come up the stage. Um, but I'll take just a couple if I can hear them. Um, so uh, let's go ahead. Do you have a question? Okay, uh, so the question is, uh, when do you use a 9-iron versus a wedge? Awesome question. Um, what I like to do is, um, it really depends on the amount of green I have to work with. Okay? So uh, what I do is I look at the percentages. If I have, uh, you know, like maybe 40% uh, rough okay, and 60% green, well, I'm not going to pitch the golf ball. I'm going to chip the golf ball. Because remember, the definition of chipping is where the ball travels the majority of the distance on the ground. So that would be an excellent opportunity to use a 9-iron. Okay? And again, that's a different setup than we've discussed. Um, I usually don't even think about using a 9-iron to pitch the golf ball. Because by definition, pitching is where the ball travels the majority of the distance in the air. So it's going to be pretty tough to get a lot of air time with a 9-iron. Okay? So definitely remember those two differences. differences. Yeah. So is your first, if you can chip, you choose chipping first? Absolutely. I, I, here, here's my, my little theory. Chip it when you can chip it. Okay, well, I'll take it that back. Putt it when you can putt it. Okay, if you're on the fringe, putt it. I mean, 
you're not gonna you're not gonna chunk a putter, you're not gonna blade it. So putt it when you can putt it, chip it when you can chip it, and only pitch it when you absolutely have to pitch it. I, I, I teach a lot of junior golf. And uh, you know, they watch the tour, they're filming Mickelson's and doing the flop shots and you know, they'll be like two feet off the green and they're taking a sixty degree and they're you know, like this, I'm like, holy cow, there's so much chance for room for error there that that's none of the tour players would ever use a sixty degree only three feet off the green. There's not one. There's not one. They're only using that flop shot, that specialty shot, when they absolutely have to. They know it's a high risk shot. Whereas if they keep it low with that little nine iron, there's not a lot that could go wrong. So that's a that's a good good observation. Question? What are your risks doing when you're in the swing? Are you releasing it all? Yeah, great question, great question. Um, I get a lot of a lot of questions other than you about, about what, what do the risks do in the motion of a pitching shot, okay? Well, it's a, it's a tough question because what you want to do is you don't want to be stiff. Um, anytime you're, you're stiff or tight, um, you're opening up uh, the chance to blade it, okay? Think about what the difference is between a loose muscle and a tight muscle. A tight muscle is shorter than a loose muscle. It always is. No one will argue with it, okay? Because when you tighten your muscles, you contract, they contract and they get shorter, okay? So you don't want to be stiff or rigid. I feel like the brush stroke drill or the, the little, that little, uh, uh, I like to call it attention release drill, um, will allow you to kind of allow your wrist to stay nice and flat. Because you, you don't want to get rigid. Rigid is going to cause bad things to happen. And then you don't want to like force a wrist hinge. You know, if you're talking about especially bunker shot or a flop shot, you know, that's a different, different subject. Depends on your handicap range. You know, I'm probably going to talk about some, some flop shots with more like a single digit handicapper. Okay. But um, what I like to do is, um, you know, if you look at the design of the golf club, there's not a lot of weight here. There's a lot of weight here. Okay. So if you take the club back and just be relaxed, it's going to hinge just slightly. Okay. There's not a certain degree or anything. I'm not going to get that technical. It's impossible to get that technical. But there's going to be a little bit of a hinge. You can see it right there. And all I'm doing is I'm basically moving my chest back and just letting the weight of the club slightly hinge my wrist, okay? Now, um, I'm gonna add one other thing to that to follow through, okay? Um, we only need rotation when we're trying to hit the ball as far as humanly possible, okay? We only need that rotation, okay? So if I'm trying to get a desired trajectory with uh, the least amount of roll, whatever the shot calls for, I'm going to try to feel like that face is more towards the sky, okay, without holding on to it or guiding it. Okay, so it's a little difficult, but I'm definitely not going to do this where I turn it over, okay. So you see my watch pointing at the screen. I kind of have a sensation of feeling like my watch is pointing to the sky, okay. Or the logo on your glove if you don't wear a watch playing golf, okay. So very good question. Um, one of the things. Uh, uh, but one of the most common errors I see in, in amateurs is um, they, they do get wristy. So they end up trying to flip it like this. Okay? And um, at last count, I think there's about 207 bones in each hand. Okay? That's a lot of moving parts okay? to control. So what I tell my students, and, and uh, this really, really helps out, is that I want you to have some emphasis on your chest, shoulders, whatever, right in this area here. I want you to feel like that moves towards your target. Because if this leads, this is a bigger muscle group than this, okay? If this leads, this is more likely to follow consistently, okay? There's no way, I mean, if I got 150 balls, you know, I could probably hit some pretty good shots like that after 150 balls, okay? But out on the golf course, driver, seven iron, also we got to pitch it. You get one opportunity to pitch it over that bunker, that little pond, out of bounds over the green. Stressful. So uh, that's a good, good question. Hope I answered it. Okay. Remember, chest towards your target. Bigger muscle groups are more likely to control the small muscle groups. That's going to be about the end of my time. Uh, again, my name is Rick Tim, and I teach out at Family Sports Center. So uh, I look forward to having the opportunity to improve your game.